So, uh, good morning, all. <clears throat> we have with us uh, John Patrick Molini. Uh, welcome, sir, for uh, this session, and thank you for uh, giving your uh, time for the valuable session with the audience. We have audience, uh, I think, in room, we have around uh, 650, around 650 plus people at present, and uh, many are from uh, uh, YouTube Live. Uh, around 400 people are through the YouTube live or the many other people are who are going to attend through the YouTube live. So uh, the session will go like this. Uh, after starting the session, uh, John will explain all the re all the functionality about the tools, how it is important for the fingerprint comparison, how it is useful. And uh, once we'll end with the session, we'll allow audience to ask their question and they can type their question or I, I will enable uh, typing that time so that uh, session will go smooth and nobody will get disturbance in between the session by having a different messages. Those who are on a YouTube live, they can type their question on a YouTube. I'll try to take maximum questions from the YouTube and the chat box. And once we, uh, after uh, the session, if you are not able to take all the session, uh, you all can send a session through, uh, all can send a question through your uh, uh, feedback form and the question form and we'll publish the same blog. Two blogs from one from the Michael Steed and the Dennis is already ready. We'll publish within two or three days. So you'll get all answer of your queries. But here we'll try to take the maximum question, really maximum relevant question. So here I'm going to welcome again uh, John Patrick Molini for uh, giving your time and accepting our invitation for uh, uh, giving a session on fingerprint comparison in digital age. So uh, again, uh, the whole world is suffering through the corona, so we send you the warrior of the corona from uh, company SIFS India and the fingerprint comparison software. So uh, welcome, John. Uh, John is a director of forensic comparison software. John has a 20, uh, 20 year as a latent fingerprint examiner uh, with the, um, uh, like managing fingerprint section at the Northern uh, police, Northern uh, Territory Police, the Australian Federal Police, and the Australian Immigration Department. In 2005, John educated the uh, forensic comparison, uh, introduced the forensic comparison software into the work practice of the Australian Federal Police. This software was later to go on a radically change the work practice of the fingerprint technology or, uh, and the, for the technician in the Australia. Uh, in 2012, John founded a company named Fingerprint Comparison uh, Software uh, with his son, Matthew, who is a software engineer with a Microsoft today. Uh, this software is being used by uh, close to the 50 agency worldwide, including all Australian police and the border agency, UK, Scotland Yard, Swiss National Police, over 20 agencies in the USA, including the US Army. And... Uh, uh, our company, SIFS India, comes with a collaboration with the John to introduce this software into the Indian uh, uh, college, to the Indian fingerprint bureaus, to the Indian uh, universities. So we are going to introduce this software in India. Uh, company about the John uh, that uh, is of uh, the company uh, of the John uh, John name is the uh, forensic comparison uh, software company provides software for the latent fingerprint technician for image enhancement, analysis, comparison, and charting. It also provide an optional FS tools for the searching database of the fingerprint uh, of up to 50,000 individual and beyond in forensic comparison software is in effect that multi-purpose tool for the latent fingerprint technician, the one, uh, the one stop shop for all the digital image requirement of the fingerprint case workers and uh, here, uh, two software versions uh, we uh, have as, as a product in the John company. Uh, uh, one is a forensic comparison software that is a standard version 5.6, provides the fingerprint technician with all the tools required to conduct a fingerprint analysis, comparison, and enhancement using the digital images. Second is a version 5.6 plus FS, uh, includes all the capability of the standard version along with the capacity to search fingerprint database of the various sizes. We have, uh, we welcome all the participants uh, in this. We have uh, more than 3000 uh, participants from the different 58 countries and the 650 uh, 
organization and our participation is increasing day by day uh, like uh, in every lecture series we are getting a more and more participants so we welcome all the participants from the different country like uh, uh, afghanistan uh, and uh, argentina bangladesh including all these country if i miss any name to mention here uh, you all are welcome into the session and uh, now i'll uh, request john to uh, take over the session and john is over to you well, thank you very much, Dr. Singh. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, I'm going to um, call up my screen and here we go. Okay, well, thank you very much again for that very nice introduction. As uh, Dr. Singh was saying, uh, the fingerprint comparison software company was formed basically to fill a need. In this presentation, I'll be describing the history behind that, uh, that development of the software and maybe talk about some of the different issues that may have arisen over that time to come to the, uh, the point where we could have a digital fingerprint comparison system. Okay, just coming up again, having a few issues here. Okay, I've just got a black screen. Having a little trouble displaying that uh, next screen for some reason. Uh, you can uh, stop the screen share and again start the screen share. Okay, I'll try again. And now we can see. Yeah, it is visible now. Okay, I might have to. Um... There we go. Uh... Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Have a bit of a technical problem there. So um, I'm just going to explain perhaps what the fingerprint comparison software is. It's basically side-by-side -side comparison of fingerprint impressions. Now, many who are in the fingerprint field already know this, but just for those who are not, I'll just explain a little bit more what it does. What it does, it allows the technician to look at a, an unknown fingerprint, perhaps from a crime scene or from other, some other source with a known fingerprint. The known fingerprint could come from a set of inked fingerprints or from a live scan set of fingerprints that have been taken of an offender or some other person. And that includes fingerprints from the palms and feet. Many people don't realize that this, the, rich, the rich skin on the hands and of the palms and the fingers are exactly the same as the sort of skin that's on the bottom of the feet. And they're just as useful in identifying people. So I just wanted to point that out. A lot of people actually don't know that. And it's fingerprint comparison is basically there for two real reasons. The first one that everyone seems to know about because of all the CSI programs is in solving crime. But there's another real important purpose that this software comes um, is, is solving, a, a problem it solves, and that is in the administration of the justice system. In, in any police system, the identity of people is absolutely paramount, and a positive identification is necessary for all parts of the, of the judicial system. If you go to court, one of the first points of evidence that the, that the prosecutors have to put up is the identity of the accused. And in many cases, the identity of the accused is established through fingerprints. So many people actually don't understand the importance of that side of things of fingerprint comparison. So crime solving is one thing that, it, that is very uh, useful for, and that most people know about that, but also the administration of the justice system. Right. I'm going to go into, I know Dr. Singh has already sort of talked about my background a little bit, but I'm going to go into it a bit more uh, in more depth because it was my background and experience that I had to uh, 
solve problems in the digitization of fingerprint comparison. And it goes back now 20 to 30 years where digital uh, 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 cameras first came on the scene in the 90s and, and all the way through the last couple of decades where technology has advanced in leaps and bounds so that we can get to this point now where we can do digital fingerprint comparisons. And I'm also gonna talk about the rise of other digital technologies, such as the explosion of uh, storage of digital imaging now that's possible. Back in the 90s, there was a real problem in storing this much data. Digital images take up a huge amount of the space on these systems. So in the beginning, there was not enough really to, so to save all of the images that we were creating. And I'm gonna go into more depth on the fingerprint comparison software itself. And I'm gonna describe how it's the missing piece in this technology that wasn't there, it wasn't present until we came along and invented it. Because before that, there was not anything out there that filled that particular niche in the, in the, in the workflows of the fingerprint comparison work. And then I'm gonna go into the fingerprint software itself and demonstrate how it is, is used by a fingerprint, tech, fingerprint technician to enhance their workflows and to, and to enhance the fingerprints uh, in getting better quality and in marking it up so that they can present that in their case files. So first, the background and experience. I joined uh, the Northern Territory fingerprint section in 1990. And at that point, uh, there was not any digital cameras around. I might've been a few of them. No, but they were very rudimentary and we weren't using them in police at all. And we were using basically 35 millimeter film, which we developed ourselves. We developed our own negatives and we, um, and we developed uh, uh, photographs from those negatives. It was actually quite enjoyable process and I enjoyed developing my own film, but it was very slow and very expensive process. And so a digital technology uh, uh, sped up that process dramatically. And we were also, uh, we had, I think, one PC in our section at that point, one personal computer. And that was a real uh, problem later on. We really had to increase the number of PCs so this digital digitization would become possible. The Northern Territory, just to go back a little bit, the Northern Territory is a Northern province of Australia. And it's very sparsely populated. It's got a very high um, crime rate. And we had about 10 technicians. And we were basically a, a sort of a, a, a mix of crime scene and fingerprint experts. And we went out to the crime scenes and did some of that work. And we did the fingerprint work as well. And um, we had a very young bureau. And uh, we, were, we worked very hard. But it was, it was quite enjoyable work. But it was very, very time-consuming work. In 1998, I was appointed the sergeant in charge of the Northern Territory fingerprint section. And I immediately had a different take on things because all of a sudden my staff started to come to me and complain, complain of different health issues. And those health issues were connected to the work that we were doing at the time with magnifying glasses. We used magnifying glasses hunched over a desk to do our fingerprint comparisons. And I started to see, even though they were a young group of people, problems with uh, eyes, uh, headaches, and neck and back pain, which I'll get into a bit, bit more later. Anyway, that is at that point, I decided to look at digi digital cameras. And they were still very you know, rudimentary. And th there were still problems with storage of these images. And we didn't really have um, very good ways of printing out uh, uh, fingerprint um, photographs from those images. So the printers were very poor, in fact. So later on in 2004, I was um, seconded by the Australian government to assist in the management of the Australian National Anchors. Now that gave me a kind of a, a, an insight in how these big APHIS systems work. And, and and it also gave Australian agencies the ability to download fingerprint forms in a digital format. Now this opened up a, a possibility that we can now start looking at 
putting these digital images onto a screen so that we could look at them on the monitor instead of through a magnifying glass. So that was very useful. But it wasn't until I became the team leader of the Australian Federal Police in 2005 to 2008 that I really got to be able to solve some real problems that we had in getting this digital um, workflow up and running. And I'll go into those later. In 2009, I was, uh, uh, I was headhunted basically by the Australian Immigration Department to start up the first Australian Immigration Fingerprint section. And that allowed me to see also the, that side of things with the, the use of fingerprints in controlling borders and how large amounts of data was going from country to country in establishing whether a person is at risk to that country. So that was, that was also very good. In 2010, I think uh, Dr. Singh 2012, but I think it was 2010 that we started up our Forensic Comparison Software company. And that was because we couldn't get any funding from the government when I was within the Australian government. So we had to go on our own way to get the funding to, to process or to further the development of the software. All right, I'm just gonna go back into a little bit more detail about my time with the Northern Territory Police Force. You can see a photograph of me there. That was my younger days when my hair wasn't gray and uh, I was a bit fitter. I've put on a few pounds since then. The, the main way of uh, uh, capturing fingerprints back then was 35 millimeter film or fingerprint lifters, those sticky lifters that take off the fingerprint from the, the exhibit or the point of entry of a crime scene or whatever. And we had paper fingerprint forms. Everything was inked. All of the forms that we had, fingerprint forms that came in were inked by an individual before they got to us. And some of the quality of those fingerprint forms is poor because of, of the uh, sometimes lack of training. Sometimes it was just people who, who really didn't pay attention to what they were doing. So there was a sort of a mixed, uh, 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 a mixed quality of the fingerprint forms that came to us. And of course, we did everything with a magnifying glass. Everything was magnifying glasses. And just to say, my right eye was the one I use for, uh, for magnifying glasses is now my, my bad eye. My left eye is now my good eye from years and years of using a magnifying glass. It does damage your eyes. And everything was paper. Paper case files were the, the norm. So it was sometimes a cluttered workplace because of that. Okay, now I'm going to get back into the real staff issues that I had at that time, which was the neck and back pain, the eye strain and the headaches. This is obviously the, a result of leaning over a desk in this manner. And if you talk to any OHS people these days, they, they look at this in horror. But we did this for decades. And they and some of the older people in, my, in the section that I was in had done it for 30 or 40 years. So, and, and all of them without, without uh, exception had problems with their neck and, necks and backs. Um, the only thing that kind of saved us was that we got out and did crime scene work a lot. So we got to mix it up the days um, so that we didn't have to do just only, you know, magnifying work. We could do other work outside and get a bit of rest from that. Now, what I did try when I was the officer in charge of the NT police was to introduce a digital camera. Now I mentioned before there was, a, there was a problem with digital storage. Now I introduced this Sony 1000, which is it's kind of archaic now, but back then it was state of the art and it wrote the images directly to a little CD that was in the back of the camera and the CD became the evidence. Before I mentioned that the, that the, that the fingerprint, um, sorry, the, uh, the negative was the evidence. The negatives was in part of the chain of evidence and that was handed up to the courts as part of the evidence in that case. But to replace that negative, we had to have an actual physical thing. So we used these CD, little CD, uh, uh, little discs to hand up to the courts as part of the evidence. And it seemed to work well for a while. It also solved our storage problem because we had all those storage in the CD we didn't have to store it in a, on a hard drive, a hard drive somewhere else. <clears throat> it also solved the chain of custody issue, because if you can uh, 
use the CD in the chain of evidence, you can sign for it and give it over to the courts or between the, the investigating officer and the courts. So it solved that issue. Uh, the, the challenge I also had is I had limited number of PCs, but over the time of my 1998 to 2004, I did manage to get everybody in my section in their own PC. And I even got them to get their own dual monitors, which is a help in doing these digital comparisons. There's also a, a huge limitation in the printers that are available. If you're going to print out a, a, an image of a fingerprint and then use that in your comparison process, you lose enormous amounts of quality going from that point to the printer. You can see things on a, on a monitor in much better detail than you can from a printed piece of paper from a printer. And we were, we were suffering also from a lack of image enhancement software. There was Photoshop. Now everyone talks about Photoshop, but it's enormously complex and more, it's very, it's over the top as far as what we really needed. It was, uh, uh, we only had maybe one or two people in our section who really knew how to use it. The rest basically couldn't use it because it was so complex and it was also expensive. And I sent some of my people on courses to do Photoshop courses. And they learned all of these great ways of taking a photograph of a girlfriend in the sunset but I, I didn't need that. I just needed this one part where they actually did the, did the enhancements of fingerprint forms, which was a tiny, tiny part of the course. So it was a bit of a waste. So that was a problem I had to overcome. So when I joined the Australian Federal Police in 2005, I still had my team. My team was a bit bigger. It had 23 people in it. And uh, it was spread out all over Australia and other cities but I was still having to deal with problems to do with the poor posture of my staff people because they still had this issue of leaning over a desk. The printers were better, but they still weren't as good as what you could see on the monitor. Te technology was marching ahead. There was, there was improvements, but it still wasn't quite there in the, to a point where you could completely go digital. We still had paper-based workflows and cluttered workspaces. You can see one of my team members here is, uh, he's actually doing a, he's involved in a homicide there and he's got several suspects, several um, um, offenders, and he's got lots and lots of latent fingerprints from the crime scene all over his desk. It's very unorganized, it's very cluttered. It's not ideal. So I was looking for a solution and my son, who was uh, at the Australian National University at the time, I was talking to him and I was complaining to him that I would have to give up fingerprints because my eyes were starting to fail. My back and neck were giving me problems. And I, I, was, I was saying to him, look, I'm gonna to have to change my career path because I can't do this anymore. It's just too, it's too painful. And uh, I had, had said that there was attempts out there to uh, create a fingerprint comparison software and they were terrible. They weren't usable. People wouldn't use them because they were so hard to use. And I did try them once or twice and they weren't, they weren't up to scratch. And he said, look, dad, I think I can do a better job. And of course I thought, well, okay, you, you try and see what happens. And, and he did. And he came back with this package that was actually very, very good. And I thought, well, this is going to save my career. So I thought, well, I'll go to the bosses and I think I'll talk to them about expanding this software as the missing piece that we actually needed in this digital workflow. And we uh, got funding from the, the government because they were actually worried about the health of their, their uh, fingerprint people because they were getting so many complaints. So I, I got funding for dual monitors for every desk. I got everybody a flatbed scanner. And I upgraded their PCs because back then the PCs uh, had difficulty handling high definition, very large image files. So I upgraded our PCs that they could handle them quickly. And I put in a change management plan where I went around and I convinced people, my team members, that this is for their own benefit, their own health, which it was. And uh, I had no resistance whatsoever in implementing this software. And it was a huge success. Between 2007 and 2008, we had dramatically improved team health, we had much less absentees from all sorts of problems associated with uh, necks and backs and headaches and eyes. 
We could also do far better, more difficult uh, latent examinations because you could use the monitor to zoom in on the, the latent fingerprint and you can uh, come to conclusions a lot more easily because you could see the detail a lot easier. There were improved efficiencies. We were able to um, declutter desks. You can see one of my other team members here with their dual monitors, their, their um, scanner, and there's not, or oh, there's a little bit of paper there, but very little paper. And so we were able to, you know, make the workplace far more efficient. Other, other things that we hadn't even considered were now improved as well, and that's the training outcomes. My problem before the digital processes were, was that if I was trying to train somebody, I really couldn't see what they could see. And they, they were using bits of paper and they might be marking up photographs, but I actually couldn't get into the processes that they were going through when they were trying to make assessments on fingerprints. With the, the digital uh, workflows, I was able to go and see their process, the processes of their thinking and correct it if I needed to. Far, far more efficient way of training people. The other thing I could do is because I was one of the, I was the officer in charge, I had to do a lot of reviews of cases. And reviewing cases is um, very difficult in your eyes because you, you're actually basically using your eyes all day through magnifying glasses. But now I could, I could use these digital workflows to more quickly work through the case files and I could see more clearly what the processes people were following when they were making identifications and I could use that to improve my supervision of my staff. Okay, now I've worked through that pretty quickly, but I'll just say here, um, uh, reiterating what um, Dr. Singh was saying earlier, that when I brought in this, this, this software, in the beginning, we gave it away to the Australian agencies for free. So we had to start a company to fund it, uh, to develop it further, because it had so much potential, but we couldn't get government funding. So this was the only way we could progress the software. Today, after we've used, uh, been able to sell the software for about 10 years, we have all the Australian agencies using it, as including immigration, and you can see the list of other agencies that are using there. And we're up to now 60 plus agencies worldwide. So we've we've spread mostly around the the um, the, the more advanced economies, uh, but it's now I think we're seeing countries like um, uh, Vietnam and and uh, Thailand and other countries seeing the the benefit of, of this software. In, in other terms. And that's because we added a APHIS to the software. Now that was quite a big move for us. What it now means is that you can do most of your processing that you require to do digitally on this one piece of software. You can actually do all of the enhancements, the comparisons, the analysis, plus the searching of all your, your um, suspects or your elimination prints for your um, uh, if you're offenders and um, uh, piece of people of interest in, in one package. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go and look at the software itself and I'm going to show you how it all works. And those of you who are fingerprint technicians will be able to understand what this means because it makes everything so much easier than with uh, the manual uh, magnifying glass uh, workflows. So just give me a second here, I'm just gonna change screens. Okay, what we've got there is the software. This is the forensic comparison software. And you can see that there are two blank screens. The left screen is for the unknown and the right screen is for the known. And I'm just going to drag some of these images across that I have here so that I can, oh, I can basically drag it across. So I just left click onto an image or a fingerprint image and I drag it across to the left screen and I let it go and it immediately appears. Now, the, the beauty of that is uh, it's quick and it's easy. It's, it's, it's intuitive. That's what it is. And it's 
it's something that people, everyone can understand, especially in these days of mobile phones and things like that. Drag and drop is something everyone understands. And it's, it's necessary to be that easy because you're trying to get people to look at this as, a, as a, an alternative to their manual magnifying glass workflows. If they can't see that it's easier, they'll revert back to the magnifying glass whenever they can. So what I had to do early in, in, my, in my change management is to ensure that this process was easier than what they were doing now, so that the process of changing over was easier for them to do. So now that you've got the image on there, you may want to change and look at some other images. So we have a tool here called Next or Back, and I can just work my way through all the images in the folder. Now, if you're a, a person who goes out to crime scenes and you gather fingerprint evidence and you bring it back to your fingerprint bureau, you may want to go through all your images in your folder that you've got for that particular case. And you wanna, you wanna zero in on the one that's of interest, the one that's gonna give you a, a match that you can use to tell the detectives if it's an offender. And you, you'll zero in the one that's either A, uh, clear and easy to look at, or B is, is a highest evidential value. Perhaps it's, it's at the point of entry of a break and enter or something like that. So you wanna zero in that quickly. So this is the best way to do that is keep going next to all the images. The, or you can just go ahead and drag each image in turn if you wanna see a particular image. Okay. I'm just gonna go back to my uh, fluorescent images. And I'm going to show you now that you've got it onto the screen, some tools to make it look easier to look at. Now we have a number of dials at the top of the page here. And these are all the, most of the dials anyway that you'll ever need if you're a fingerprint technician. There's one here called invert and you can invert all the images to the opposite color. And there's one here with brightness, contrast, saturation and sharpen. Now saturation is particularly good for fluorescent prints or ninhydrin prints, and that it just takes out the color immediately, just dial it down. And maybe you wanna make the contrast a bit better. So the one, one to do is contrast up and brightness down and just improves the, the image out of sight. Or you can invert it so that it's white on black. And that just means that you're gonna to have to increase the contrast and fill it with the brightness a bit more. Okay, so it's very easy to use. And we can work our way through other type of um, fluorescent prints. This is a indent Diane print. And I'll just load the other one so you can see the before and after. And I'll just explain here too, I just, I forgot, I just jumped over a few things here, is the left click move. So you left click on the, on the image and it moves as you move the mouse. And you can right click to rotate. and you can zoom in using the scroll button. Okay, so I'll just do the invert, use saturation to take out the color. I'll put contrast up, brightness down, and keep doing that until I've got the best possible combination. Okay, I'll try the next one, and another Ninhydrin print. And again, I can invert it, or I can just use saturation to take the color out, up contrast and down brightness, and then up contrast again, until you get the perfect image. Now it's gotta be easy, it's gotta be quick, and you don't wanna to have tools that they don't need to complicate the whole process. Occasionally you might come, a very rare occasion where you might wanna to go to a specialist in, in enhancing a fingerprint for some reason, but 99, to, Point time, nine times out of a hundred, this is all you need as a fingerprint expert or a fingerprint technician. And you can reset it back to the original fingerprint. Okay, I'm gonna load some images here. And this one here is a finger. I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit more. I'm gonna improve the it's already a very good print, so I don't have to do much to improve it. But if I zoom in all the way, 
depending on the definition of the um, uh, of the of the image, you can zoom right into the pore level if you need to. Okay, now that you've got that, I might just select another fingerprint. I'll just go through and select a better one. All right, this one will do. Okay, now I'm just going to improve the contrast on that. Brightness down, contrast up, and a bit of color now. I'll just take that color out. Okay, what I can do now, now that I've got a, an image on there, I might want to search it against my internal APHIS, my case APHIS. So what I'll do is I first have to tell the system how big this fingerprint is. So I go to edit, then I go to ruler, and then I set the image size. And then I go to APHIS and then I search. Okay, a couple of hits have come up. So I just double click one of those and I've got a fingerprint to compare it with. Okay, it's matched against this one particular finger. So what I can do now is I can go to another tool that matches both of these so that they're the same uh, resolution. So if I zoom out like this, I hit match zoom, it zooms out that one. I move back, I hit match zoom, it moves back. The other thing here is quite a useful little tool is called the lock. If I lock this, then I, it'll zoom in together and zoom out together and I can turn it at the same time. Okay, I'll just turn that lock off. Now that I've got to this point, I may want to start my actual uh, comparison and analysis. And I can do that by just marking a feature. Now I'm just going to mark two features there and I'm going to use that as my start and I'm going to go over to the, the known and do the same. All right. And then I'm going to work my way around the fingerprint. And I'm just going to use the, the standard, uh, I'm just going to match zoom that so it's the same. And I'm just going to keep working my way around and I'm going to come to some conclusion pretty shortly that this is made by the same person. I like to do it in twos. Okay. Now I've got to that point, I may want to uh, uh, save my comparison and I can do that uh, by copying it. Just go to copy and then I can bring up a Word document and then save it. Just make it a little bit smaller. There. Okay, so this then can be printed out and be part of your case file. Or you may want to have a chart. Now, I'll see if I can get this to zoom in a little bit like that. Zoom that one in a bit as well. I might just do a chart on that one. Okay, so I go to my reporting page and I hit chart and it immediately creates a chart. Now, some of these lines need to be moved over, so I'll just do that. Just move that over there and I'll move that one over there as well. And that's pretty good. So you'll see the numbers are not quite in order. So I'll hit auto number. So all the numbers are now in order around the border. But maybe I don't want to use numbers. I'll use letters instead. So I can put letters around the outside. And then I can copy that and put it into a, in my case file. and use that as part of my case file. Or maybe I'll just want to print that out and send it up to the court as part of my evidence. Okay. Now, I'm just going to get rid of that and I'm going to put in a, uh, what could be a, a piece of palm and I'm going to tell the system how big it is. I'm just going to change that to, 15. So it's about 15 there. And I'm going to search that. And I can do a 360 search. So you don't really need to know the orientation of the finger. All you need to know 
is that it's a finger and you just hit 360 and it searches all the way around. So I'm searching, it's gonna take a bit longer because it is a, a 360 search and it's come up with a match. And the match is of the palm area, this area here of the palm. I'm just gonna take that margin out, there we go. So you can do palm matching. So what about footprints? Now, footprints are notoriously difficult. Uh, and the reason is, is because you get this sort of thing. It's who knows where that, what that part of the footprint that is. It could be anywhere, probably the heel, but you don't know. So it's just basically lines and you can basically make, make out a few uh, ridge endings here and there, but that's it. Now, what you can do is you can search that and it's come up with a match on the foot. And it's basically this area of the foot here. And you can see that's the full footprint there. So if you want to zoom in on the footprint, you can probably find where that is, but that's going to take a fair bit of work. <laughs> okay, now that we've done that, we're going to look at um, the palms. We've done the fluorescent fingerprints. We've done the all of those. You can do things like the uh, interdigital area here, uh, the flanges on these parts of the fingers here. Generally, they don't get picked up uh, very much except on, say, the flats of the 10 print. So you can still do uh, identifications off that as well. But with, with live scan, these kind of images are far more likely to be matched against because they are also um, part of the search system on the big emphasis now is you can match against the flats of the, of the, um, of the fingerprint um, capture. Well, that's a lot of information. It was all at once. Um, perhaps I could go back to Dr. Singh for some questions, uh, if there's any out there. Uh, thank you, John, for uh, explanation to us the functionality of this uh, software. So uh, now I request all the audience, uh, all the participants, uh, those who have the questions related to the working of the software and whatever the things I allowed you to, you can type your question. I will take a question uh, and I'll ask to the uh, John and John will reply your question. So the question, uh, uh, the person who are on the YouTube live, they can also write a question into their YouTube chat. I'll take the question from their relevant question. Okay, the question was from uh, many people that what is the name of software? So name of the software I already described, it is your fingerprint comparison software. That's correct. It's Forensic Comparison Software Company. The yeah. software itself is called Fingerprint Comparison Software. <clears throat> uh, the question is from Nivedita. Uh, does this software give a definite result or does it narrow down to the possible prints? Well, like all APHIS um, searches, it will give you a candidate. It is up to the human operator to make the decision. That is universal. You can't put up a system to be examined in the court. It has to be a human, a human expert to go and um, to confirm the identification and then defend it if they have to. It, all APHIS is, all you do, all they do is give candidates. And generally a high scoring candidate is often the person, but you still need a human to confirm. Yeah, the next question, how a pattern can be classified through this software in a footprint cases? Um, I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, can we classify the pattern of footprint? What is a pattern of footprints? Ah, when you say classification, you're talking about a Henry classification or something similar. And I don't know if there is one. Uh, probably not. There isn't that many uh, collections of footprints. Generally speaking, footprints only come uh, become useful if there is a suspect and that you can take that suspect's footprints and confirm it against a fingerprint from the crime scene. There is, there, there are no 
uh, databases of footprints that I know. Yeah, so next question is from the Kartika Rishi. Uh, is this software able to distinguish between two different overlapping print on a surface? Ah, right. What you're talking about is some APHIS systems or some uh, vendors have a way of taking two overlapping fingerprints and then separating and making them uh, two separate images. Now, it doesn't do that. Those circumstances are extremely rare. And if you're a fingerprint expert, you can differentiate between fingerprints if, you're, you know, if you've had a bit of experience and knowledge. And I've had overlapping fingerprints in the past. And really, you can still do the identification. You've just got to be careful about, you know, uh, um, looking at the right uh, minutia with the right image. So no, this doesn't do that. Yeah, it's very rare that you would need to do it. Uh, next question is from Vishal Mishra. Uh, is this software is able to differentiate between a natural and the artificial fingerprint? No, uh, that is something uh, an expert could do. Uh, in certain circumstances, it, it's it's basically we all fingerprint experts should be taught to look for telltale signs of um, of a fingerprint that's been um, fabricated, and there are telltale signs. But I, I'm sure that someone out there is, is is clever enough to make it so that it's almost indistinguishable. So no, the software doesn't do that, but an expert sh should be aware of it fingerprint expert yeah uh, next question is uh, uh, in an arson case when fingerprint is burned up to dermal uh, can we recreate yeah. through this software no no uh, that would be a technique uh, that you would have to do in a, in a laboratory and we some of the techniques uh, out there for burned uh, fingers basically is, is, is photography. Burned fingers are extremely fragile and they sort of crumble. So it would be mostly down to getting the right angle in the photographs. This software is applicable for countries or a private lab to start with. Can this software be uh, useful in the Africa country? The people are asking. Yes, definitely. It yes. Is cool. Well, it's, it's ideal for those kind of countries because it's not, um, you don't have to have uh, specialized hardware to use it. You, you can use it on a standard PC with standard operating systems and it, operating systems going back 10 years will uh, use it easily. So it's, it's extremely uh, flexible uh, in all circumstances. And if for some reason your computer gets lost, stolen or broken or something like that, easily replaced. You just have to download the software again. You do have to be able to store the databases if you have them in a secure place. That's the only thing you have to be careful of is you always secure your databases. You back them up and because you don't want to have to recreate those. Uh, but the software itself, all you have to do is download it again onto a new PC and you're up and running again. Uh, which, uh, what is the file format of the image used in this software? Uh, well, any, any image format that is out there can be viewed on this software. It, it'll go bitmap, JPEG, TIFF, RAW. It'll even do PDFs. And if people out there know what a NIST file is, which is the standard uh, image, um, image uh, formats between APHISs. APHIS has used a NIST kind of uh, format it, it displays NIST forms as well. So any any um, image format it will display it on this. Uh, does this software helpful in the incipient ridges or the less developed ridges? Uh, I'll say that again. Sorry. Uh, uh, is this software is helpful in the incipient ridges or the less developed ridges? Well, it would be far better for for what uh, third level detail. Third level details such as uh, pores and gaps in things like this. If I move straight in and saw close up, so it's a bit blurred that one. Might just get a different one. Um, if you can zoom right in, you can see the pores and the, and, the, and you can make uh, assessments on the pores at a third level detail much, much easier on this kind of software than you could with a magnifying glass. 
In fact, I don't know how you could do it with a magnifying glass. It would be extremely difficult. So I think would, you would have to have uh, blown up uh, photographs to be able to do it. I guess it's easy. All you have to do is scroll in and you'll see the, the, the third level detail easily. So I'm muting some participants, those who wants to ask some question, unmuting them. So uh, Avichal Sinha, sir, you can ask your question. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Mr. John and Dr. Uh, Ranjit for arranging the session. My question is, uh, how critical is the event evidentiary value of uh, fingerprints in comparison to DNA, you know, to catch ah. hold of the suspect? So could you... I trained in, in DNA profiling myself, and that was my degree. I got a degree in DNA profiling. And then I went on and did a fingerprint degree uh, in fingerprint uh, training. So it, they don't compete for the same space, really. Um, uh, when you're looking at fingerprint evidence as opposed to DNA fingerprints, sometimes fingerprint evidence is there and it's great. Sometimes DNA evidence is there and it's great. You can even get DNA evidence off fingerprints themselves. So it's, it's a matter of uh, wh wherever you get the evidence, uh, you've got to use what you've got, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. They don't really compete for the same space. The beauty of fingerprints is that it's, it's entirely individualistic. If you're looking at DNA pro profiling, it's not. Uh, it doesn't matter what they say. To, uh, identical twins have different fingerprints, but they have the same DNA profile. Now, there's a difference between DNA profiling and doing a complete DNA sequence. A DNA sequence may find a few differences between uh, individual um, uh, uh, identical twins. But if you're talking about DNA profiling, uh, you can have very closely related people with almost the same DNA profile, but their fingerprints will be entirely different. The other thing is uh, DNA doesn't really compete with fingerprints in, in the justice system, identifying people who are of interest to the justice system who are recidivists or not, and, and all that sort of thing. So it has a different purpose to DNA profile. So one's not better than the other. They just work in different parts of the, of the forensic field. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, I'm just going to unmute uh, Himant Kumar Panda, sir. He's a senior fingerprint expert from Odisha. Sir, you can ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, can we uh, determine the age and sex of uh, a person from the print? Ah, well, there's been some work on that. Um, I, I, we can't with our software, uh, but there are people out there working on that, I know that. And uh, it, it's, it's basically, you can get a feel for it, but you cannot prove it. And I know going to crime scenes, if I see some fine ridges, I can sort of say either that is a child or it, either, or it could be a woman. But if, if, the, if the ridges are, are, are thick and wide apart, I can almost certainly say that it's an, it's a, it's an adult male. <laughs> but that's all we can do. We can't prove it in court. It's basically a size thing. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, many questions are from the participant, different participants are just formulating the question into different format. Uh, that uh, how this... Uh, Smudge ridges or the partially visible ridges can be uh, make visible through this software. Ah, yeah, that was a good question, and that's almost a, a different presentation all by itself. Now, what what we've done with this this software? I, I don't know. Can you still see my screen? Yes, I can. Um, see you want to go for another presentation? No, no. That's if you can um, show people my screen still. I can show you that that there are certain tools within the software that yeah, allows... The screen is visible, go ahead. Okay, good. At the top of the page here, there's a scanner uh, symbol and there's a, a live video symbol. And we have very inexpensive cameras that you can get on Amazon and you can use those to capture fingerprints from a, an exhibit or a fingerprint form and directly feed it into the software. It's very, very easy. And you can use scanners to do the same thing. The main tool that people use, though, is the digital camera. You can use your phone if it's a good camera on the phone. 
and you can take a photograph and then plug it into your PC and then drag it across into the software. And uh, so there, there are a number of ways of getting the image onto the screen or into your PC. Yeah, uh, next question is uh, like, they, uh, can this software recognize the differences between the two fingerprints automatically, or we have to uh, set the parameter in this software? Um, sorry, could you say that again? Is it about scaling? Is that what it is? Uh, can this software recognize the differences between the two fingerprints automatically, and what are the parameters this uh, software works? Oh, okay, well, we do have a function on here which is a one-to-one -one match. And we can do a one-to-one -one match and it'll give you a score about what the system says as far as the, how close they are in, in it to match. Um, but the score itself, if you've got any score at all, most of the time, like I haven't seen a case where it hasn't happened, it's the same person. So it'll give you a score uh, if, you, if you have the same scale and the same fingerprint on there. I can demonstrate if you wish. I'll just uh, load a finger. And I'll just zoom in and I'm going to hit one to one. I was thinking. Yes, oh, it's given the score of zero. Probably have to give scale it. That's what I haven't done yet. I'll scale it. <clears throat> Yep, scale both, zoom in, zoom in, and then I hit the, the one to one. And it's given a score, which is the top score, 1000, which makes sense because it's exactly the same image. <laughs> you, wouldn't accept, you wouldn't expect it to do anything else. So it's given it the maximum score. Okay. okay. So uh, Simi, uh, you can ask your question. I'm trying to take the question from all the parts. Simi, I, can you hear us? Hello. Yes, Simi. Yes, sir. Sir, I want to ask that uh, can the uh, burnt, burnt person Fingerprint can be taken. Burn fingerprint. fingerprint. Uh, well, yes, it can. It can search one fingerprint, or it can look at several fingerprints at once. It depends on. I don't understand the question. It doesn't take any fingerprints. What it does do, it, it allows you to capture fingerprints, and you can take a separate capture of every single fingerprint if you wish. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> yes. Uh, Rupedi, you can ask your question. No. Uh, one question was asked by YouTube Live. What are the drawbacks of this software and which kind of difficulty are faced to using this software? Ah. <laughs> drawbacks or difficulties. Well, the thing is we don't have any competitors out there. So I really can't compare it to anything else that's even close because it's, it's really the only one out there that does anything like this. Um, the drawbacks are, okay. I think we could probably add a few more enhancement techniques to it and we will be doing that eventually. Uh, so even th there's this rare occasion where you might want to use Photoshop for a few things. And I think we could probably add a few of those things so that you don't have to use Photoshop ever, ever again. Um, the, the question before about having two images superimposed, extremely rare, but it, but it is a bit of a, a, a party trick, if you like. And people like it, we might want to try and do that so that we can show that the two images are part. So there are a few things we, could, we can do and we are doing it. We're, in the next 12 months, we'll be improving the software as well. Yeah, next question is asked by, can this software identify fingerprint developed from latex gloves? 
Uh, well, that, that's a, a capture issue, not a, a software issue. Uh, when, when you're talking about a fingerprint from a latex glove, are you talking about a glove that's been removed some, from somebody and the fingerprint has been developed from the glove? Correct. Or are you talking about, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yes. Well, that, that's, that's a, a technique in, in, in um, capturing the fingerprint from the glove rather than a software issue. This really takes over once you've got an image from your exhibit. And you can use the video feed to capture a fingerprint from a glove, but it has to be developed first. You'd have to use some sort of technique to develop, either would be magnetic powder. If it's a very wet print, you'd have to dry it out and perhaps use some magnetic powder um, and or super glue uh, or something or someone like cryolite ester, if you wish. Um, but I'm, I'm not an expert on enhancement and detection techniques. I'm more of an expert on software. Um, okay. How, how the software will be useful for the educational institution? Ah, well, this is, this is where they really come into their own because all of your young people are used to using digital uh, type devices, either it be a PC or a phone or something like that. They really don't understand why you want to be using a magnifying glass. I just don't get it. So in a training institution, they can see the value, um, the, you know, the students see the value of seeing, seeing, seeing something on a monitor and using that to uh, develop fingerprints. They, the young people pick it up immediately. But also, if you've got your own laptop, and most students probably do have a laptop, the, 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 um, the lecturer can um, uh, uh, show the, the students the techniques and the software, and they, the, the student can immediately copy that on their own laptops. So the software can be easily put on everybody's laptop. You don't have to have special facilities. Most people have this technology at their disposal. Yeah. Uh, next question is asked by how much time required to compare one fingerprint and what are the DPI of images is required for comparison? All right, DPI, generally speaking, across the board in fingerprints has got to be a minimum of 500. Uh, ideally, it should be 1,000 DPI. Anything lower than 500, it starts to get too much pixelation. That's for anything to do with fingerprints, you know, aphises or anything else. Uh, this software will handle any size image. It doesn't matter what size it is. It's more to do with your PC's capabilities of handling a very large image that restricts the software. So, um, yeah, I think that answers the question, basically, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, how the software can be used uh, in comparison of fingerprint from the scene of crime? Well, because it's now digital, the, there is the capacity, and we've done it, of capturing images at the scene and sending them directly back to the fingerprint bureau for a comparison and enhancement and uh, an analysis. There is also the capability of taking your laptop to the scene with your software on it. And this is particularly useful for things like major crime or disaster victim identification. If you have a plane crash, and I've dealt with plane crashes and I've dealt with the tsunami in, 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 uh, in um, uh, Thailand, the, there is a real advantage in being able to just put a laptop under your arm and go into the scene and then setting up your identification uh, section. And you can be bringing the uh, images from the victims uh, over to your laptop. You can be photographing or scanning them or something and putting them in and doing a quick check. I mean, you'd have to have the victims' uh, fingerprints, you know, the, uh, the fingerprint records and things like that already on the laptop, but you can Im immediately do an identification there and then. And you can start releasing bodies back to the, to the relatives immediately. So there's a huge advantage there. And major crimes, the same thing. If you can get a, a laptop with all your suspects and all your local offenders on it and take it to the scene, you can turn around to the, to the detective and say, that fingerprint was made by Joe Bloggs. And he can go immediately and track down this person and hopefully solve the crime quicker. And there's lots of advantages in solving crime quickly. 
through this software, can we differentiate between the post-mortem and anti-mortem fingerprint in cases of DVI? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Fingerprints are fingerprint. Uh, but with, with uh, anti-mortem data, it will be in the form of a fingerprint form normally. When I was dealing with the tsunami uh, victims, we often got children for, with fingerprint uh, taken from their bedrooms, you know, or from books or from finger painting. So you can tell almost immediately what's anti-mortem and what's post-mortem. So the post-mortem stuff is, comes in as sort of a standard uh, fingerprint from the body and you can, it's easily, you know, determine which is which. So, uh, uh, see, uh, still I can say the 300 plus questions and their comments in the chat box, because it's very difficult to take all the questions. So, uh, I will say all the participants will take your question, will try to collect all the questions from YouTube Live. And still, if you want to ask any question, you can uh, ask your question through the YouTube Live. And uh, before uh, uh, ending uh, this session, uh, I would... Uh, do the things which we already uh, doing for the other presentations and other speakers. So I would like to thank uh, uh, John for taking such a informative and wonderful uh, session. And I would like to uh, John to accept this uh, certificate from uh, Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. Although we are in a virtual space, but take it as an actual certificate, uh, which we give during our lecture and the conferences. Thank you for uh, giving your time and uh, explaining all the things. As we are coming into the collaboration, Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science and the uh, Forensic Comparison Software, we are going to launch several courses in India for the training for the police officer, for the university, and the uh, uh, hands on training for the different uh, bureaus and fingerprint experts. So, you all are welcome in this uh, different trainings, and John will come to the India. And I invited John along with the family to come to India, and we are ready to host him to give the training to the, all our uh, participants. And apart from this, uh, any uh, lecture or anything cannot be success because of the team supports. So I would like to thank my uh, team member who have worked uh, for designing certificates and reaching to you all through the so different social media. So Ravi, Kalas, uh, Sudhakar and Nitika, they are doing uh, lots of backend work. And uh, uh, because of them, uh, we are able to reach 3,000 plus people from the different 58 uh, plus countries and those who have given the, their participation. And the dedicated team, those who are uh, posting on a different portal, reaching to you, Kartika Mishra, Vaishnavi Thakre, Lakshya Kalga, Pooja Chakravarti, Dr. Janta Jashuja, Tanvi, uh, Tanya Jaswal, and Tanya is uh, reaching to the all portal, all people. And thank you, my dedicated team. So I would like to my, uh, give certificate to my dedicated team, kindly accept this certificate also, as uh, you all will get on an email, but uh, accept this in a virtually. So Kratika, accept your certificate. Vaishnavi, Lakshya, Janita, Dr. Janita Jasuja, uh, Ms. Tanya Jaswa, Dr. Pooja Chakravarti, Kailash Negi, Sudhakar Yadav, Nitika, you all uh, accept a certificate from the side. And uh, as we are doing this, uh, uh, conferences uh, in this lecture series, international lecture series are free. Of course, we are not charging anyone. And uh, uh, till now, we have uh, uh, given a certificate to the all participants and uh, through the my member because we are in the lockdown. And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, our supporter Avichal Sinha for supporting Manish Singh Ankita for supporting uh, in this uh, by making a donation to the DePaul so that my volunteer can. Uh, work with the enthusiasm that people, yes, people want uh, to support us. They are giving a donation for such kind of arranging such lectures. And as we are in the lockdown situations, but uh, this uh, donation from your side, making our volunteer to work more and more enthusiasm and reaching to more and more participants. So uh, all the participants, you all will receive your certificate within two days. Uh, two days. Uh, so uh, I will request everyone uh, either on a Zoom room or those who are li uh, watching live on the uh, YouTube, you will get, even your friend gets certificate and you are not getting, uh, please don't worry, you will get your certificate within two days. We are sending a certificate through the alphabetical order and uh, that's why uh, might be your friend get early and you get later. 
So uh, with this, uh, uh, I would uh, show the certificate of participation. You all will get the participation certificate like this. So your name will be there along with the certificate number. So you all will get your certificate. And this, uh, I would like again, thanks John for giving your time in this evening of Australia okay. and afternoon of uh, uh, India and uh, different uh, country participation. So uh, every, you know, all the lecture is successful just because of the uh, participants. If the participants are giving their input and they are uh, giving a feedback. So it gives encouragement to organizers like us to do and more, uh, do and uh, more and organize more and more lectures. So definitely John will welcome you to uh, see you in India very soon once the lockdown is over and the COVID situation is good in the okay. world. So, uh, well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. So uh, you all can, uh, for future update, you all can uh, follow our Facebook page and uh, you can uh, like or subscribe our YouTube channel so that you can watch a live. I'm just going to announce our next, next lecture and next lecture, or uh, again, it is uh, the lecture series is for the Sunday only. So next uh, lecture will be on the next Sunday, that is on the 24th. And it is going to be more excited because it is based on the Ted Bundy, a famous murder case. And the person who is the author of this Netflix series, you uh, have seen the Netflix series based on the Ted Bundy and uh, uh, the Bundy murder history, a comprehensive by the Kevin Bullion. We are going to read the teaser also along with the registration link. So you all can join this uh, lecture in our um, next Sunday. So thank you all. Thank you so much for uh, attending. Thank you, John, for giving your time. Uh, again, thank you so much, John. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.